Miles Fowl was immersed in a dream in which he was debating the existence of the fabled Pentaquark with Murray Gellman, who had originally proposed the existence of quarks in 1964. Miles knew he was dreaming because Gellman had passed away not so long ago, and also because Miles was losing the argument. As we had already gleamed, Miles did not relish losing arguments, and his distaste extended to his dream state, so he decided to wake himself up. But rather than emerge fully into wakefulness, Miles suspended himself in a hypnopomic state of threshold consciousness, in which he could think in a superfast mode without alerting his captors to the fact that he was indeed alert. Beckett referred to this semi-suspended state as sleepy-wakey, which Miles had to concede described it perfectly in layman's terms. Miles had no doubt that he had been abducted. He remembered walking across from Father's office toward the main house when the ground erupted beneath his feet. And then... Of the rest, Miles wasn't certain. Could it be, as his memory insisted, that he had been swallowed whole? Surely that wasn't possible, but that had been in his impression. Had he been slimed? Swallowing and sliming would seem to indicate the involvement of dwarves. The whole thing seems impossibly juvenile, like one of Beckett's stories. Miles dismissed the very recent past for the moment and regressed to the quite recent past. Why was all this happening? Were they, in fact, in the middle of another extended adventure? The Chinese general Sun Tzu had written in The Art of War that the holy secret lies in confusing the enemy so that he cannot fathom our real intent. And we are certainly confused, Miles thought now. But that was surely temporary, as bringing order from confusion happened to be one of Miles Fowl's specialties. If a mysterious antagonist was moving against the Fowl Twins, then it would seem logical that the Fowl Twins had unwittingly involved themselves in that particular antagonist business. So what have I been up to? wondered Miles. Perhaps some multi-international is threatened by my advances in the field of DNA storage. Or could it be that my plan to use Beckett's cluster punching ability as a cure for migraines has alarmed the pharmaceutical company? No, he realized. It is, of course, the acronym treasure. Miles had learned, by hacking into the organization's supposedly secure email server, that the source for all of the agency's funding was held in their Florida facility, which was why he had been checking it out in the tachyon. Thus prepared, Miles Fowl opened his eyes and saw that he was in a dark room with light emanating in phosphorescent sparkles from the depths of this wobbling mattress. Globs of the same material were adhered to three of the walls. His bed was a quivering slab of what could have only been the bell of a giant jellyfish. The substance lit a neuron in Miles' memory. Those are dwarf spit lanterns. I am reposing upon dwarf spit, Miles realized. Plus, I was until recently covered in it. How fascinating. And this explains my confusion as, according to Dr. Fowl's frankly overwritten files, there's some form of sedative in the gel. Miles blinked to clear his vision as much as possible, then studied his cell for that what surely what it was. The glow from the bed crept across the packed mud floor, but dissipated before it could brighten the walls, which were deep in viscous shadow. Miles suddenly berated himself for his flowery thought process. Viscous shadow? Really, Miles? Perhaps a more pertinent detail than the viscous shadow is the fact that there is a dwarf lady seated on a stool beside your bed. Miles often argued with himself in the second person, as he believed it as a way to teach his unconscious mind new thought patterns. Miles studied the dwarf lady for her nonverbal cues as to who he might be dealing with. He calculated that she was perhaps three feet tall, with corpse pale skin that showed off her room tattoos nicely, and copper red hair that was coiled in bandolier braids around her shoulders and torso. Her bearing bordered on regal, and Miles guessed that this lady was close to the top of whatever food chain she hunted in and it seemed as though the dwarf was focusing on his golden tie, though it was difficult to be sure, as the eyes that regarded him seemed to be all pupils, and Miles wondered if dwarf eyes had UV-receptive cones like some bats. But that was by the by. What Miles was really interested in now was the confidence that emanated from those eyes, which confirmed his deduction that this was no lackey. He was dealing with the boss here, or at least someone high in the command structure. I wonder, he thought, if Lace Lady will attempt to form a bond with me, hoping to develop a Stockholm Syndrome situation in which the captain grows to rely upon, trust, and even befriend the captor. If she's dull enough to admit this entire trick, I shall play along. Hello, human, she said. 
I am Gavel Hortmet, and I have killed more men than you have had in days in your life, so do not believe we could ever be friends. Quite the intro. Miles winced, not at the words themselves, which he presumed were hyperbolic, but at the dwarf's harshly accented English, which with every consonant put him in a mind of axe hacking at a tree trunk. Let's try that again. Miles winced, not at the words themselves, which he presumed were hyperbolic, but at the dwarf's harshly accented English, which with every consonant put him in mind of an axe hacking at a tree trunk. Women and children too I have slaughtered continued Gaveld, her viscous grin exposing a grill of engraved gold teeth. So trust me when I say that dispatching you to whatever version of hell you are surely bound for means less to me than crushing an ant. Far less, in fact, as the lowliest ant actually contributes something to this planet. Gaveld Hortnut stood, and Miles was quite smug that his estimate as to her height was inch perfect. He noted that she wore a short sword scabbard from hip to knee, which gave him a handy reference for her femur to body length ratio. It was, incidentally, one to four, if he was not mistaken, corresponding with Dr. Fowl's notes on dwarf proportions. I shall leave you for five minutes to organize your thoughts, said Gaveld, cutting across his calculations, so that you may most efficiently transmit the information I need. I'm sure you know of which information I speak, boy. Just to sharpen your mind, there will be a forfeit for meandering. For every superfluous syllable in your delivery, I will take a finger joint. Nod if you understand. Miles nodded, his mood shifting quickly from smug to anxious. It was, he realized, the specific nature of the threat that had intimidated him so. A joint per syllable. Good, said Gaveld. Miles watched the dwarf lady leave the dank cell and thought, No Stockholm Syndrome for Miss Hortnut. Straight to threats. Then... I'm in a pickle here. The foul twin held up his scar and concentrated, but there wasn't so much as a faint buzz to indicate that Beckett might be on his trail. My brother is nowhere near, he realized. I'm without Beck, I'm more, and more than a mere pickle. I'm in mortal danger. Beckett was also in mortal danger, though it was made clear to Lazuli that he did not grasp this notion when he said, Oh, look at these guys. I think they want hugs. Hugs? thought Lazuli. The only reason Hortonet dwarves ever hug anyone is to crush their bones. In fact, one of the dwarf band's signature martial arts moves was a version of the Heimlich maneuver, the main difference being that the hugger did not unlock his fingers until the huggy coughed up their heart and lungs, both of which would be punctured by splintered ribs. Hugs? she spluttered. They have swords, Beck. Stop fooling around. Don't worry, said Beckett. I remember those special forces guys in Amsterdam. Lazuli did remember those guys. Of course she did. She and Beckett had made a formidable team against the foot soldiers of Akronim. See, a lippy file, the Fowl Twins. But the twin had never faced the likes of these dwarves. Hortnut Reclaimer's training began shortly after birth, and the majority of the lessons were devoted to myriad methods of converting live humans into dead ones. Lazuli decided that when she and Beckett had a little more time, if they had a little more time, she would tie the twin down and make him listen to the Horton Up backstory, which did not have a happy ending, a cheery beginning, or, for that matter, a light-hearted middle section. These are more than just special forces, she said with some urgency. These are Horton Up reclaimers. The dwarves advanced, twirling their crystal swords in complicated patterns, forming almost hypnotic light fans in the late afternoon sun. Ooh, said Beckett. Look! Look, thought Lazuli. They want you to look. That's the whole point. And she saved Beckett's life the only way she could, by booting him in the backside, knocking the boy off the ledge just in time to avoid a sudden scything slash from a dwarf blade that seemed more deadly than pretty now. Beckett was surprised for a nanosecond, but then rolled easily onto the pebbled beach. When he stood, Lazuli saw that the boy's entire demeanor had changed. He was battle ready now. It's about time, thought Lazuli. Then she stopped thinking and started reacting as the dwarf switched targets, and she was forced to retreat at speed. She used the unpredictable mixed bag of movements she had learned from training in the martial art of Kos Tapa, which translate roughly from the gnomish as quick-footed or of blurred feet. 
It is an aggressive combat style developed by the diminutive pixie race from a study of animals such as hyenas, cats, and small breeds of dogs, which were often forced to take on larger foes. The martial art was so effective that it had migrated to the human arsenal and was adapted by the legendary Madame Ko for use by the prospective bodyguards in her academy. Kaz Tapa's mantra was to always be on the attack, even in retreat. The Zuli sensei in the academy, a gnome who liked to speak in infuriating riddles, had once told her that a squint and mold sees only its own dreams, which Lazuli had considered for long enough to suspect that it was useless in combat situations. However, the same gnome had once lost patience with her during a simulation and yelled, For Danu's sake, Heights, even going backward you still set up your opponent! Which was a lot more to the point than that nonsense about moles. Lazuli used this strategy now, and even with the dwarf blade whirling dangerously close to her unarmored stomach region, she kept an eye on her attacker's stance to see if she could lure him off balance. Keep coming, she broadcast at the dwarf. Keep coming. The Hortnut Reclaimer obliged with some enthusiasm. The second dwarf targeted Beckett on the beach. The blonde twin was very impressed with the fancy footwork the chap used to approach. Initially facing away from Beckett, the Hortnut Dwarf trotted up a dune and backflipped onto the top, landing on the surf behind the boy. Bravo, said Beckett. Very good. The Dwarf too spoke, his voice garbled by mesh that covered his face. Beckett had never heard this tongue before. It was an aggressive sounding language made even more so by the guess that the sentiment was in fact most likely aggressive. By the end of the second sentence, Beckett felt he had enough grasp on the meaning of to attempt conversation, though, as it would turn out, he was mostly wrong in this assumption. Wait, friend, Beckett said, surprising the reclaimer, who had never heard a human attempt any of the dwarf dialects. There is no need for us to engage the cattle. Beckett had misspoken, but this was not entirely his fault, as the Hortnut dialect was quite limited in the actual sounds contained therein. Linguists estimate that this particular vernacular, which is one of over a hundred dwarf variations, contains no more than 20 sounds in total, including clicks, strident vowels, and gagging noises. With so few available noises, it is inevitable that certain words and even complete phrases sound almost exactly alike. So, when Beckett said with some urgency that there was no need for them to enrage the cattle, what he actually meant to say was, there is no need for us to engage in battle. The actual phrase is altered somewhat here to make the point in English. Surprisingly, this mangled attempt at Hortnut speak stopped the reclaimer in his tracks, and ironically, it had the desired effect of the intended phrase. It was the word cattle that did it, as this particular dwarf was terrified of cows. He lost a good friend in a stampede in Brazil. So the dwarf spared a fraction of a second to spin around, spasmodically checking for cows, reasoning that in his long and bloodied combat experience, no human would be able to accomplish much in the way of an attack in a mere fraction of a second. Which just goes to show how wrong a person can be. For this fraction of a second gave Becca Fowl ample time to land his favorite blow, the Cluster Punch. To recap, the Cluster Punch is a non-lethal blow aimed at the junction of the body's principal meridian lines just above the right kneecap. If an attacker could strike that cluster at precisely the right angle, with exactly the correct amount of pressure per square inch, the victim's entire system would spasm and they would be left paralyzed for a brief period. Unfortunately for Beckett, dwarf physiology is completely different from that of humans, even though dwarves are, roughly speaking, humanoid. It just so happens that the dwarf meridian lines intersect above the left kneecap, something Beckett might have instinctively figured out had the reclaimer not been swaddled in a suit of vines that concealed the tug of his tendons and the bloat of his gas pockets. However, Beckett's strike did have an unexpected side effect, which might have lead one to believe that the gods of fortune favored the blonde twin. The side effect was as follows. Male tunneling dwarfs can store up to a thousand pints of compressed gas in their gastrointestinal systems. Technically, at this pressure, the gas was mostly been converted to a supercritical fluid, and the dwarf's supplementary intestine is lined with powerful constricting muscles that can contain even a packed to bristling intestine for short periods. The intestine is stoppered by an internal ring of muscle fed by a major artery that continues down through the right knee and around to the heart in a very delicate circuit. And, as you might have guessed, Beckett's strike effectively closed off that artery, causing the muscle to fail. 
For a moment, the dwarf felt nothing other than a mild surprise that a human had managed to land a blow on a fearsome reclaimer. Then his internal ring relaxed, and a cyclone of air, liquid, and semi-solids exploded through his bum flap, not exactly at the speed of sound, but certainly with quite a measure of speed and sound. The effect was spectacular. A thundering jet funneled through vents in the dwarf's combat pantsuit, and he corkscrewed into the air like a punctured balloon. Beckett's jaw dropped with surprise, even though his day had been fairly fart-sectric already. This was surely the Mount Everest of flatulence. The reclaimer was propelled along the beach and landed on an island's northwesterly tip, where he disappeared into a hole that Beckett could not remember being there yesterday. I can worry about that later, he thought. Laz is still fighting. And fighting she was. But not in the traditional sense, i.e. on the offensive, as Lily was seemingly in full retreat, drawing her bigger, more powerful, and more experienced opponent toward her. The dwarf's shimmering sword cut light patterns in the air as it slashed toward Lazuli's organs, but so far the pixel was untouched. Though the first cut did seem inevitable, as with each slice, the blade whistled closer to its target. Then Lazuli stumbled backward and Beckett's heart dropped into his shoes. No, Laz, he thought, and the sword flashed downward, surely to cleave his friend to the bone. But somehow, Lazuli suddenly was not falling. She had jammed her rear foot into the earth and pistoned herself back the way she had come. This move seemed more like it should have cracked her shin bone like a dry branch, unless, of course, the pixel had planned the whole thing, which, of course, she had. I have one shot, she thought, a single punch to put this dwarf assassin down. Yet Lazuli knew in her heart that one punch would not be enough, no matter where she hit him. She was vaguely aware that Beckett had pulled off something very Beckettatian, but she could not spare so much as a flicker of her gaze toward the twin. All of her attention was needed for the dwarf. The dwarf grunted as he realized what was going on. It was a grunt of grudging admiration for the pixel's fighting spirit, but there was no anxiety in the noise. Yes, she could land a blow, but that would be the end of any attack. Yes, the dwarf might stumble back a few steps, but by now his brother Reclaimer would have killed the human and could assist him in this hybrid. No doubt the ruckus behind him was as a result of the boy being slaughtered. So, the dwarf took a shot to the jaw, which sent him stumbling backward as foreseen, but he never could have foreseen what happened next. Which was this. The masked dwarf, realizing that his stumble would send him over a ledge and onto the beach some three feet below, decided to offset this tactical disadvantage by performing a trademark Horton up backflip so that at least he might land on his own terms. And so, instead of making a futile attempt to halt his backward motion, he accelerated and threw himself over the edge. He sensed, in the way of virtuoso athletes, that the flip was good and he would stick a solid landing, and he also became aware that the human boy was directly below him. What he did not know was that this human boy had a trick up his sleeve, that being his arm, which was connected to his fist. Beckett anticipated the dwarf's flip and mapped out the trajectory before the Hortonut Reclaimer even took off. When the dwarf sailed overhead, Beckett nailed him with a cluster punch, which collapsed the dwarf's muscle ring, releasing the jet of compressed air, supercritical fluid, and the semi-digested beef jerky that this Hortonut was never without, slamming the poor fellow into the ledge head first and knocking him out cold. Lazuli clambered over the brink. Are you okay, Beck? She asked between gasps of her breath. I did a new thing, said Beckett, gazing in awe at his own fist. I broke two dwarves. Lazuli scanned the shoreline. Where, where's the other one? Over there, said Beckett, jerking the thumb. He went down a hole that I don't remember being there. Tunnel, produced Lazuli. These two were the rear guard, and the rest were subterranean. Beckett tried to pick up a signal from his twin on his scar. I can't feel Miles, he said. He's gone. Beckett's posture was slumped, and Lazuli felt an ache of sympathy for him. What we should do now is try to contact Commodore Shart, he realized. She will summon the cavalry, and the navy, and possibly the air force. But Lazuli knew that tunnel dwarfs, especially Hortnut ones, were built to collapse shortly after use. And if they didn't follow their quarry right away, not even LEP scout with ground penetrating radar would have prayer of pricking up the trail. Lazuli flipped the unconscious dwarf onto his back and pulled off his suit with a half dozen explosive yanks, 
leaving the dwarf clad in a skin-tight onesie that had not seen the inside of a washing machine in some time. The outer suit was a no-tech affair that seemed to have been woven from tree roots that may or may not have been as still alive. It was pungent and too wide to fit well, but from a distance she might pass for a dwarf for maybe 10 seconds. Maybe 10 seconds will be enough, she thought, trying not to imagine what an entire band of Hortonuts would do to an imposter when she was found out. While Azuli wiggled into the suit and helmet, Beckett, for perhaps the first time in his life, assumed the role of responsible partner. Maybe you should wait here, lads, he said, the cautionary words not sounding right coming out of his face. I thought maybe Miles was taken by people we could run the rings around, but these fellows are dangerous. Even Oswald didn't like them. They're spooky. I don't have swords. Lazuli appropriated the dwarf's weapon and gave it a few practice swings. I have a sword too now, she said. Still, said Beckett, maybe I should go alone. Miles is my brother. That's right, said Lazuli, sliding the blade into its sheath on her hip. And he's my friend. In fact, I might be his only friend. Beckett nodded and then, without another word, ran toward the tunnel mouth.